you know, lots of stuff happening right now. Number one question I got over the weekend was, is what's happening in Afghanistan have anything to do with the financial markets? I mean, could this be the tipping point, right? Uh, the answer is probably no, and we'll explain, to, you know, explain a little bit more about this. I mean, there's other things that are going on right now that suggest the markets may be at risk here, and we're going to get into that in just a second here. But, you know, just a quick note, uh, interestingly enough, my wife, uh, I've talked about before, you know, she sells liquefied natural gas, and she does, and they're doing a lot of bunkering right now, bunkering uh, natural gas at ports to fuel ships, right? So she was down in Port Arthur about four weeks ago. And four weeks ago, she's a port author, and there's big ships coming in with just tons of military equipment on it, all coming back from Afghanistan. And she was talking to one of the dock workers there, and, and he says, oh, yeah, we're expecting 40,000 pieces of equipment over the next several months as we extract out of Afghanistan. Interesting side story of this, of course, that was also a month ago when Joe Biden makes a White House press conference that says this will absolutely not turn into another Saigon. We are not going to see helicopters over the embassy evacuating residents. Well, of course, uh, three weeks later, here we are, helicopters over the embassy evacuating individuals. Kabul has, has now fallen into the hands of Taliban, of course, the, the complete collapse of Afghanistan, 20 years worth of military interventions, billions upon billions of dollars spent, you know, fighting this war in Afghanistan. And the outcome was inevitable. Um, we talked about this about five, six years ago on the show saying, look, you're fighting a religious war. These people don't quit. They will fight to the last man because this is about their religion. This isn't about building peace or unity or trying to create a democratic society. You know, it was interesting because both President Bush as well as, as, as President Obama said, you know, we're not in the business of nation building. That's the only way you win this war. And uh, not surprisingly, or once you, once you pull out, the entire collapse happened very quickly, and that's what happened over the weekend. Now, the question then, of course, is does this have an impact? By the way, all that military equipment that was expected to come back got bombed over the weekend <laughs> so, because they don't want it to fall into the hands of the Taliban. Um, so what does this have to do with markets, right? Well, markets are built on confidence. And things that disturb confidence in markets are things that you need to be worried about. Now, it's not just what's happening in Afghanistan. We've talked about this before. Geopolitical risk are a risk to markets. What's important to markets is about confidence and stability. And we've talked about this over the last several weeks, that stability eventually leads to instability. The question is only when does it happen and what causes it? Now, the question is, is what is happening in Afghanistan right now, is that going to lead to instability in the markets? Probably not. The reason is that this isn't something that markets are really focused on right now. It's something that's fairly isolated. It's something that will likely not spread into a contagion into other countries at this point. Um, it may be a problem down the road if we get back into more terrorist activity, uh, obviously, but right now that's not going to be a destabilizing risk, most likely. Now, could be wrong here, but most likely that's not going to be it. What is a problem is what's happening with consumer confidence right now, and this is a function of stuff that's been now happening over the last six months, and we've been talking about this on the show. Last week, consumer sentiment in August fell back to, pre back to the pandemic lows, right? Consumer confidence right now is at levels that we saw right in the midst of the pandemic. In fact, it was the most negative surprise of consumer confidence on record. Now, why is that? Why, why did consumer confidence just collapse all of a sudden? Well, could it be the fact that all the government stimulus ran out? <laughs> You know, August and September, everybody comes off unemployment benefits. They got to go back to work. That's pretty depressing for me as a consumer if I've got to go back to work, right? It's a lot more fun sitting at home. Um, but when you take a look at Consumer Sentiment Index, it's back to 70, lowest level we've seen since 2011. Consumer expectations, this is a really interesting part. Consumer expectations of what they expect is going to happen is actually dropping rather sharply. Now, this is this is you know, interesting considering that right now we have more job openings in the country than we actually have people unemployed according to the official roles, right? So, I mean, plenty of jobs for everybody. Wages are supposedly going up. If that's the case, why do my expectations suck?
because, again, this is about the real economy, not the artificial economy that we've been creating and talking about now over the last six months. Remember, 80% of the people on this, on this consumer sentiment expectations index don't invest in the financial markets. Only the top 20% do. Um, outside of that, expected change in financial situation in a year drop markedly down to the lowest level we've seen since 2014. Expected real household income, right? Okay, plenty of jobs, wages going up. Why is consumer expectations of household income plummeting right now? Well, because no more government checks are on the horizon at the moment, right? So this is really where this consumer confidence comes to. This is about money and what people have. Large expectations of purchase of large household durable goods. These are things like washers, dryers, refrigerators, those type of things, right? The big drivers of durable goods and households falling back to the lowest level we've seen since the 2020 pandemic. Buying conditions for large household durable goods. Again, just the price related change. Just a huge, massive drop here. How about automobiles? Exactly the same way. Expectations of purchase automobile. Not surprising with used automobile prices higher than new cars. But this is all a function of those inflationary pressures that we've been talking about. And speaking of inflationary pressures, we keep watching the spread between the producer price index and the consumer price index. Now, this is just the difference in the two indexes, right? Highest level ever on the spread between these two. And whenever you've had these previous big spikes in the spread between PPI and CPI, has typically aligned with major market peaks. Why? Because that is margin pressure on businesses. If the producers can't pass on inflation to consumers, that suppresses margins, which impacts earnings. And that's where, since market prices are based upon earnings growth and better outlooks for earnings and, and, and earnings, right? You're going to have a big problem if you start getting margin compression. So this is the one thing to really kind of pay attention to here more than anything else. This is one of your key indicators, of course, those consu higher consumer prices weighing back on that consumer confidence, right? If I don't have the money to, to maintain my lifestyle, my consumer confidence declines. And that's even if you're giving me more money. You can give me money, but if the price of the thing I'm purchasing are going through the roof and I'm not keeping up with it, my consumer confidence is going to decline. A couple other things here, though. Uh, equity fund flows, again, highest level on record. People have been just throwing money into the markets in terms of retail investors. They've been piling in. And, of course, the important thing to think about is when you have record inflows into stocks, that's people putting their money to work. Great. That's awesome. What happens when they run out of money to put in? Inflows are always an important thing to watch here. And lastly, stock buybacks here near a record. Not surprising with high prices in the markets, corporate insiders who are the biggest beneficiaries of stock buybacks taking advantage of exceptionally high prices in markets to well, basically put some dollars in their pockets. Their confidence is very good right now, by the way. Um, be right back after the break. A lot of stuff to get into this morning. I do want to talk about one specific chart we talked about in our newsletter over this weekend, talking about market liquidity. So we come back from the break. I'll show you that chart. We'll talk about it and tell you what that means about potentially the markets and where we are right now. Don't go away. I'm your Lance Roberts for The Little Investment Show. In this weekend's newsletter, we talked a little bit about the liquidity alarm, and I got quite a few emails over the weekend about one particular chart discussing liquidity in the markets and you know ultimately what it means. And again, we've been notating over the last really – few months about the, the real levels of exuberance and the in, investable speculation that's going on in the markets and, and ultimately why this leads to a reversion to means. And I'm not always right away, these things can last, you know, these periods of exuberance can last a lot longer than you think. But what is important is that these things always reverse at some point. The, the question is what causes it? And there's two things that are going on right now in terms of liquidity itself that, that are worth paying attention to. One, of course, is the Federal Reserve. I'm actually writing an article on this because of this collapse in consumer confidence that if you go back and look at 2010, Ben Bernanke was just about to launch the second round of quantitative easing. And to justify doing another trillion dollars or so of, of QE back then, he said, look, the whole purpose of this is to inflate asset prices so that we can boost consumer confidence. Stronger consumer confidence will lead to increased economic growth. Well, 
we got increased con consumer confidence. Never really did lead to stronger economic growth. We just kind of muddled along right around 2%. But it was it was consumer confidence, and there is a there is a correlation between the level of consumer confidence and QE up to this point, until now. And this is the interesting thing: the Federal Reserve is doing 120 billion dollars a month in QE, and consumer confidence is collapsing. So for the first time that we've seen since really 2009, the correlation between the Fed's policy and boosting consumer confidence is broken. Now, what does that mean for the markets? I'm not sure. But we've talked about for a while on the show that at some point we are likely going to see Fed monetary interventions not being effective at creating the Pavlovian cycle. Is this the first shot across about? Is this the warning sign that the potential of Fed monetary policy is breaking? And it's also interesting coming at a time that there's now more and more taper talk by the Fed. The, the taper talk by the Fed is now really rising to the point that even CNBC, right? Even CNBC is noting that we could see an announcement on taper as early as September because of the rising level of voices from the Fed. That's coming at a time that you got consumer confidence collapsing, housing market showing some signs of cracking. Now you're going to cut QE? Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. But this goes back to liquidity, right? It's all liquidity. $120 billion a month. You're pushing that into the markets. That's creating lots of liquidity to push asset prices higher because that money's got to go somewhere. But when you start talking about QE, there is a rate of change in liquidity. And when you take a look at the idea of of liquidity itself and this was something again that we you know we've talked about before in the past the recovering of the economy is drinking from the same punch bowl that the market is and this is where this chart of liquidity comes from and this was the chart that was in our newsletter this weekend and what's happening is is that the liquidity that's being put into the markets is being absorbed by the economy and the markets, but more of it's being dragged away from the market by the economy itself, right? People want to, have to buy cars and houses and other stuff rather than investing it into the stock market. So that, and, and it's, it's basically this formula called the Marshallian K, which is a measure of liquidity of what's going into in, in kind of leaving the markets to go other places. And that's what we're seeing right now is that that is negative for the first time that we've seen really since 20, the, the kind of the pit of 2020. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the, the market's about to have a major crash, but, you know, the last two times this has happened, you had between 15 and 20 percent declines in markets. Of course, right after that was when the Fed said, oh, wait, I'm just kidding about the, just kidding about pulling out liquidity. But this is my point, right? So here it is, the Fed starting to talk about taper at a time where you've got consumer confidence collapsing and people are expecting absolutely no impact to the overall market. So look, there's a high correlation between consumer confidence and the stock market. So now you've got this collapse in liquidity, collapse in confidence, and now you've got the Fed starting to taper, which is only going to negatively impact the psychology. I mean, there's a real risk here that the Fed, and we talked about this before. Look, the Fed's in a trap. If you pull liquidity, you're going to cause a decline in the markets, which is going to impact confidence even more, which is going to slow consumption can slow, uh, and slow economic growth at a time where you don't have any more stimulus coming in from other areas of the market. Or the, or the government. So this really doesn't seem like it's going to really work out all that well. But again, this is, this is, the, this is that very narrow tightrope that the Fed is walking. Every time they've tried to extract themselves out of doing QE or doing, you know, trying to hike rates to normalize monetary policy in the economy, we have bad outcomes in markets, and so they reverse it. This is what's called the liquidity trap. Liquidity traps are really two things. 
the, the, the exact definition of a liquidity trap is when you drop interest rates to very low levels and nobody wants to borrow money, which is exactly what's happening right now. The second measure of a liquidity trap, which is really not talked about much at all, is simply the function that you supply liquidity and it doesn't work. It's kind of thinking about, you know, if you have a small fire, you can throw a bucket of water on it and put it out, right? When you have a raging bonfire, a bucket of water is not going to do anything. And that's kind of the problem that the Fed is in right now is that any changes they try to make to changing or tapering liquidity, and if you'll notice, the size of QE has to keep growing every time we do this. We did $900 billion the first time, $1.2 trillion the second time, $1.8 trillion the third time. We're doing $120 billion a month now. It has to keep growing in order to keep things kind of moving along. But, and I've written, I've shown tables on this before that we've done, every round of quantitative easing has gotten less and less effect from the QE itself. In other words, it's taking more and more gasoline to get the car moving every time we do this. And this is because markets are bigger, economy keeps getting bigger, but mostly mostly markets. And so the problem for the Fed now is, hey, I want to extract this. But now you've created this big giant gap between where prices of markets are now and where they should be. And so leading to potentially a 50% correction in the markets just to normalize asset prices and valuations is something that the Fed can't stomach. Because the subsequent collapse in consumer confidence will drive the economy into a recession. And then what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to have to do QE again. And so here we are back into this trap. See, the Fed's only got two policy tools now to really work with. One is QE. Second is interest rates at zero. They don't want to go into negative rates. Negative rates are destructive for the economy, even though we, we really do have negative rates now after inflation. But the Fed doesn't want to drop overnight lending into negative territory. That's bad for the economy, and they know that. It didn't work in Europe. It's not going to work here. So this is the trap they're in. The question is going to be, do they try to push ahead with taper this month or next month at a time when consumer confidence is already front running the taper? Be right back after the break. We'll talk about the three things that will tell you when to get out of the markets. That's coming up next. Don't go away. Afghanistan, liquidity, Fed taper, all suggest that the market's about to crash, right? No. There are three things that you want to watch for to know when to start getting out of the markets. And do we have, so the first thing that you need, now, this isn't what's required. I'll get into that in a second. But in order for there to be a reversion to the mean, right? A big correction. You've got to have big extensions first, right? So, you know, if markets are already trading a deep discount, then they're not going to go down a whole lot more, right? So there's clear evidence we've got that. For instance, if you take a look at the number of stocks and, and really the price of the market, I should say, trading above the two-year moving average, we're now at one of the highest levels in history, going back to the 1950s. In fact, there were only really kind of three other times we were here, and both of those led to decent corrections. Uh, of course, you know, one of them was the dot-com crash. Very rarely do, do markets get this deviated from long-term extremes. Take a look at real household equity ownership. We've talked about this chart before, but very highly correlated to the Fed's balance sheet. But, you know, those in the top 10% of the economy now own the majority of the wealth. And they've had massive increases in wealth since all this nonsense began. And, of course, investors taking on a tremendous amount of margin debt. Very sharp increases in margin debt. None like we've ever seen. You know, right now, this spike in margin debt is nothing we've ever seen in history. 
people just taking on an immense amount of leverage. We talked about the you know the the amount of money inflows coming into the markets this year. A lot of that's on leverage. So you've got all the ingredients right for a correction, but just doesn't just because you have the ingredients. We've talked about this before. It's like a it's like a can of gasoline. I can store a, cas- a can of gasoline right in my garage, and it's fine. Until somebody, you know, introduces a catalyst of some sort. Put it too close to the hot water heater, drop a match into the can, whatever it is. That's what causes the ignition, right? You got to have a catalyst. I mean, gasoline itself is inert until you insert a catalyst. Then it becomes very combustible very quickly. So that's what we're looking for. What are the three things to watch for to know when it's time to leave the markets? Now, this doesn't mean get all the way out, go to zero, go to cash. I'm not saying that also don't jump to that conclusion. But I am saying that when you start to see these things occur, these three things occur, it's time to become much more defensive in your portfolio. So, you know, first is, is inverted yield curves. Now, the yield curve is flattening right now, but it's not inverted. But back in 2019, we had an inverted yield curve beginning, and, and we warned you, said, look, this, this yield curve is inverting. It's a perfect predictor of recessions and bear markets. Nobody believed in you believe this, right? Never do. In fact, the media was going, well, it's different this time. The, the yield curve's inverted, but it's different this time because of whatever it was. Well, it wasn't. Again, All the yield curve tells you is there is a potential for an ignition. In other words, there's some crazy lunatic running around with a match. That's what an inverted yield curve tells you. Now, we're not inverted yet, so nothing to worry about at the moment. But the yield curve itself is beginning to flatten. And and real quick, going back through history, and I'll I'll show you the yield curve in a second here. But every time in history that the yield curve began to invert. If you had sold there, you saved yourself a ton of money. Every single time. Right now, again, like I said, the yield curve is not inverted. But we are getting to a very flat yield curve. In fact, yields are declining. And this has got a lot of the bond bears really scratching their heads like, we don't really understand. we got booming economy. Yields are dropping. Why? Because you don't have a real economy. And yields know it. We've talked about the fact that bonds can't be overvalued. Bonds reflect what's really going on in the economy because the yield or the interest rate that is charged for lending money, that's what a bond is. When you loan money, that interest rate charge has to account for economic growth, inflation, default risk, credit risk, et cetera. And what the market's telling you is that the bond market's not buying the economic recovery story. And to take a look at the consumer confidence number, bond market looks like they're right again. Fed balance sheet is the other thing to watch. So first thing we got to watch for, inverted yield curve. No inverted yield curve yet, but pay attention. Fed balance sheet, very high correlation between the Fed balance sheet and, um, <clears throat> their, their, and the markets, of course. And if we go back in history and look at every point in history where the Fed has been Increasing or decreasing their balance sheet, there's a reasonably high correlation to the market. When they're increasing it, the market goes up. When they're either stabilizing it or contracting the balance sheet, markets haven't done as well. And, and this just has proven itself over time. So watch what the Fed's doing with their balance sheet. And, of course, the, you know, the other issue is when they begin to not only taper – but also when they began to hike interest rates. Tapering leads to pickups in volatility and corrections in markets. When they start hiking rates, that leads to an entirely different outcome. In fact, if we go back in history, every time the Fed has hiked interest rates, that has led to really poor outcomes for investors over time. So again, what are we watching for here? We're watching for yield curves to invert, not yet. Watching for the Fed to taper their balance sheet, that may be coming. If they start to hike interest rates, which is expected to happen sometime before the end of 2023, sorry, 2022, 
my apologies. I'm a year ahead of myself. Then that's another indicator. Because, look, if we go back in history, every time the Fed has begun hiking rates, as I said, it preceded both an economic slowdown and a correction in the financial markets. And in fact, when we go back in history and look at interest rate hikes, there is generally a point and as soon as they start that process, that starts that clock ticking for the next recession, economic downturn. And those those clocks are beginning to get shorter. So what this all means, ultimately, again, you know, we kind of go back to the beginning of the story is that, you know, we've got markets that are extremely elevated, very much so like we were in 1999. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's just, it's just all it is is a representation of the psychology of investors. Psychology of investors is extremely bullish, right? They're just dumping money into the markets. We were, uh, I showed you that chart at the beginning of, this, of the show today. Got record inflows into equities. Well, why wouldn't you? I mean, the Fed's doing $120 billion a month. There's nothing to worry about. Markets can't go down. So why worry? Just put money in the markets. It's so easy to make money. Right? You buy crypto, you buy bonds, you buy stocks, it all goes up in price. Where do you lose? But that's also the part of moral hazard that we've talked about before, which is now the Fed has created this idea that I can't lose. So we've created this massive deviation between the price of the market and its moving average, which is simply just a measure of how far you have to fall just to get things back to normality of some sort. And unfortunately, looking back through history, you don't normally mean revert just back to the moving average. You generally revert beyond it, which means that, you know, a correction of 30, 40, 50 percent well within the, the, the realm of possibility. But again, it just doesn't happen overnight. You're not going to wake up tomorrow and be down 40 percent. You're going to have warning signs. It's not going to it doesn't mean it's going to happen in a week or a month or a quarter. There's warning signs. And that's the whole point of today's article on the website talking about the three things to watch for. Watch for the yield curve to begin to invert. When that happens, you've got six to nine months generally before you have an economic catastrophe of some sort. Watch for the Fed to start tapering. That's about when they start tapering. Normally, and there's the this is a caveat, normally it's about six months from the taper before you start seeing a problem. Rate hikes, six to nine months. My suspicion, though, is that this time it could happen a lot sooner because not only have you taught investors that when the Fed is doing taper, you run in and buy equity risk, you've also taught them that when they stop doing QE to get out of the markets. So the time frame between the start of either taper or rate hikes to the next downturn in equity markets could be a lot sooner than we've seen previously. Now, I don't know if that's going to be the case or not, because all we have is this history to look at, which says it's normally six months or so. But my suspicion is because we've now trained investors to respond to QE is that they will also respond faster to the lack of it. Thank you for joining me today. And of course, get by our website, get our latest newsletter. It's on the website now, realinvestmentadvice.com. Coming up here on our YouTube channel, three minutes on markets and money, and also our daily report talking about the three things you need to be watching ahead of the next downturn in the markets. That's on the website now, realinvestmentadvice.com. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.